What Tom and myself um, uh, did was we, uh, we, we, we had a little bit of discussion about this, whether we could, uh, we could do something that um, uh, I certainly never known has been done before, which is the, um, uh, uh, to talk about how bees behave naturally from a practical point of view and also from a scientific point of view. Uh, yeah, honeybees in the, in the wild, what can we learn from them? Uh, well, some of you know that fairly recently I've had a book um, uh, published, um, but I'm, I'm very definitely not here to sell books, but I do happen to have a few copies. That <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can also get them from Northern Bee Books and also on the Bibber, Bibber website. Oh, well, that's a, a, a bit of fun. What you may not know is that um, I actually own and run the Dave Cushman website, and if you don't know anything about Dave Cushman's website, um, it's, uh, it's reckoned to be um, the world's most comprehensive beekeeping website. So if you don't know anything about it, just put Dave Cushman bees into Google or whatever and up, up it should come. Some of you, some of you know that uh, if I give a talk, I've usually got a little border collie by my side um, uh, whose name is Nell. Um, unfortunately, she's not allowed in here, um, but um, uh, I've got a message from her. She's so well known that in the last three days I've had people turn up with biscuits for her, which I've got to take home. So those of you, two, seven in there. Anyway, so um, uh, th thank you all very much. Um, so my experience then, uh, I've been keeping and observing bees uh, for over 50 years. I started in 1963, and that's the key word, observing, because observation, I think, is one of the greatest... Uh, uh, things that you can do as a as a bee, as a beekeeper. Um, I've actually removed several hundred colonies uh, from wild situations. That's when I mean wild. That's where they have selected their own nests, uh, nest site. Uh, many of them um, are pre varroa, and there's very definitely a difference between pre varroa and post varroa. Uh, I used to do around about 12 to 15 uh, trees per year. Uh, until about 1990, something like that, and a few buildings, perhaps two to three. Now, I would think I do one or perhaps two trees a year and uh, might be one or two buildings, so very much less than, than it was. So the information I'm going to give you is based on observation, me seeing what the bees um, uh, are telling, um, uh, telling me, um, a bit of logic and a bit of conjecture. Uh, which may well not go down too well with the research type people because um, it's uh, generally classified as um, uh, anecdotal evidence, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I'm basically telling you what whole loads of wild colonies of bees have told me. There's going to be a lot of question marks through here. That's because I don't know the answer and I'm also going to be asking you a few, a few questions uh, as well. It's easy to learn from bees if we can understand them, which is a, a pretty obvious statement, but how many beekeepers actually understand their bees, what the bees are trying to achieve? And I ask the question, do we work with or against bees? I suggest in a lot of the manipulations that we do, and some that are, 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 are dreamt up almost sort of overnight, I would suggest it may well be the latter. Um, do we as beekeepers just simply do what we're told, what the book, what book tells us or the mentor tells us, or we go along to the local beekeeping association meeting and um, ask a question and get told an answer without necessarily working out why the bees have got in that position in the first place? Or do we actually think about it, think how the bees have got into that position and uh, find a way uh, out? What I'm fairly certain is um, uh, the bees very often have the answer before we even think of the problem. If I have a problem with, uh, with my bees, I try to think how the bees will get out of it themselves, rather than just charging off to the book or the, or, or the screen or whatever to, uh, to find a, a, an answer. So for the next hour or so, I want you folk to please, please, please cast away any views uh, you may have on wild colonies. Just get rid of them and manage colonies too, so you can have a completely open mind and you can make up uh, your mind whether um, the things that I'm telling you um, or, or Tom's telling you um, are necessarily what bees uh, do. One of the 
Main problems, I think, with, with beekeepers are they tend to humanise bees. They're not like us at all. Simple thing, um, we're warm-blooded, or most of us are, and um, um, bees are cold-blooded. I mean, that's a, that's a simple sort of um, uh, uh, thing. So, I know there is uh, other information on wild colonies that I always get quoted, but it's often American. Not that there's anything wrong in that, but... Honeybees, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are not indigenous uh, to the Americas, although um, I think there's a view that at some stage they may, um, may well have been. I think they're, because most of the bees have been uh, in, imported, probably fairly recent uh, years, last hundred years or so, they're going to be far more prolific, uh, and that gives, um, uh, gives a different sort of slant on things. And, of course, their climate and conditions uh, vary as well in exactly the same way as ours do. So let's go back a bit. Uh, how do bees get to Britain? Well, there's, um, um, there's little evidence because bee samples uh, don't seem to survive uh, too well. Yes, there are a, 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 a occasional ones, probably going back two, three thousand years, something like that. But to the best of my knowledge, not much longer than that. So it's most likely they follow the retreating uh, ice after the last uh, Great I Ice Age. Um, and then at a later date, they became isolated from the rest of the continent um, with the closing of the Channel Land Bridge. Now, we tend to think that it was a slow process, but um, I think there's quite a bit of evidence that it was actually quite, um, uh, quite quickly uh, closed. Uh, there seems to be a tsunami that, um, that happened in, um, in Scandinavia uh, which washed a load of uh, water down. But they've survived for around about eight and a half thousand years before intervention from uh, our, our ancestors. So there they are, isolated. What were those bees that needed? Well, something to eat, uh, somewhere to live and suitable conditions to do it in. They needed all three. They may well need other things, but they needed all three of those. Any one of those missing, and um, they would have uh, uh, wouldn't have survived. Clearly, they lived right on the edge of their range all the time they were um, uh, expanding. My guess is there were quite heavy losses uh, at, at, at those times, but I don't know. I've got no um, I've got no evidence at all. Um, but I'm fairly certain the those that survived must have been pretty tough. Obviously, um, natural selection would have taken anything out that was a bit on the weak side. But they were um, a native honeybee, Apis mellifera mellifera, uh, which is uh, about as tough as anything uh, you'll get. So let's just have a look at those then. Um, they evolved uh, to suit their cool, unpredictable climate. Uh, unpredictable being the operative uh, word there because we know how different years uh, vary. Uh, sometimes you get long warm spells, other times you get long uh, cool spells. So it, they're said to be uh, non-prolific. Why produce a whole load of brood that they don't uh, need because brood is incredibly hungry. Um, they're said to live longer than most of the other uh, subspecies in both summer and winter. Whether that's any more uh, anecdotal evidence or not, I don't know. They're frugal. They look after um, what food uh, they've got. And one of the ways they can do that, of course, is by controlling the breeding to suit the conditions. So perhaps if they have a fairly long period with no food coming in, the, um, uh, the queens perhaps might go uh, off, uh, off lay. Um, they need less food to uh, survive. And I've seen it in print on several occasions that our native bee um, against the Italian bee, the Italian, just for maintenance purposes, needs about two and a half times the amount of uh, food. That does several things, one of which, of course, what it does is puts less pressure, pressure on the forage out there. So there's more for those um, uh, colonies that are in, in, in existence. <coughs> um, they're heavy uh, pollen storers, which means that they've got pollen stored, more pollen stored uh, throughout the winter. So if you get a long winter and perhaps a poor spring, there's a store of pollen, and I'll be talking about, a bit about that later. 
and of course they're hardy, which we know about. They are survivors, because that's what they evolved to be, not sitting on a beach in the Mediterranean. Uh, natural swarming, uh, there is going to be a lot of guesswork here, um, but uh, I hope you can sort of follow it through, and I hope at the end of the day, uh, Tom and myself, and there's been no collusion here at all, I hope Tom and myself will come up with roughly the same uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, agreement. It's my guess that a natural colony um, uh, would swarm early in the spring. Now what I have noticed is that if bees from trees, rather than buildings and um, don't manage hives, bees from trees in my area uh, seem to um, swarm early. Very, very rarely do you get them in sort of halfway through June or back into June or anything like that. Um, now, why might that be? Well, if you think about it, uh, the earlier they swarm, there's a better chance of survival for the prime swarm and a cast, if indeed there is one. Now, we know that our native bees are non-prolific. It's my guess that naturally they may not have thrown out many casts, or not as many as a much more prolific uh, uh, colonies, simply because they may not have had enough bees um, uh, in there, uh, in the colony. Um, the earlier they um, are swarm, the more time they've got to, uh, uh, to build up to winter, because that's really what they're trying to do, um, or I think they're trying to do, um, uh, build up for the winter. If you think about it, it probably suits the colony better as well because you get a brood break of probably three or four weeks, uh, something like that. <coughs> brood, as already mentioned, is incredibly hungry. Um, so if they haven't got any brood um, and, and they've got a nectar flow, they can bring it in and they can store it. <coughs> it then gives them more time for recovery. And <coughs> on many occasions, I've had a brood break in a colony and uh, they, uh, um, if you get a honey flow, the bees will fill and cap a super in a week. Um, so, um, as an experienced beekeeper, I tend to um, uh, keep an eye on, on, on things like that because sometimes you've got to get some supers on, otherwise they just fill the brew chamber up and of course when queen comes back into lay or a new one um, uh, gets mated and starts laying, um, she's got nowhere to lay. It's my guess that the survival rate of natural swarms is a lot higher than we think. Um, I've seen it in print fairly recently that um, in the wilds only 30% of the swarms uh, survive. My guess is that um, it's very much uh, higher than that. Um, several reasons. Um, na a natural colony tends to swarm when the weather is, uh, is good. You very rarely get them when, they're, when, they're, um, uh, when the weather's bad. I'm not talking about a managed colony because I think a lot of swarms in managed colonies um, are induced in, in, in some way. And the reason for that is um, uh, possibly poor management, question marks again. Uh, anybody um, guilty of poor management? <laughs> We've got to keep you awake somehow. Um, perhaps poor hive design and use. Perhaps we, we, what, the way we use, use our hives isn't best suited to bees. Exposed to the sun. How many times do you see that um, uh, you, you should put a hive in the sun uh, so that it, uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the bees can go out and get, um, go, get nectar? I'm fairly certain it contributes quite heavily to swarming uh, and I'm not so sure it, um, it doesn't uh, uh, stress bees uh, too. And um, we tend to use, or some people tend to use, uh, swarmy bees. And if anyone's ever tried to use carniolans, sometimes they're a hell of a job to keep in the hive. Now, a native bee, Apis mellifera, mellifera um, we, um, about four or five years ago, um, a man by the name of John Dews died. And he was um, the well, leading authority on uh, Apis mellifera, mellifera. And he was absolutely adamant that in a natural state, AMM only swarmed every 10 years. Now, I don't know where he got that information from, uh, but um, I think those people I know who keep native bees, their swarming is usually uh, quite low. If that is the case, 
It means that the vast majority of queens are superseded rather than they go out with a swarm. They are superseded within the colony. Of course, if what, what's swarming for? Uh, really, it's just to maintain uh, a stable population, isn't it? So you really need almost as many colonies, or as many swarms, uh, plus a bit for losses, as, um, uh, as you do um, uh, uh, for the losses. Uh, I'm suggesting from that that naturally colony losses are quite low. How long does a natural colony live? Um, I think it's a lot longer than uh, we, uh, we make it. I'm talking, of course, pre-Varroa. Post-Varroa, we've got a totally different um, uh, situation. Um, when I started keeping bees, a lot of people worked on the land in some way. Um, uh, they may well even have been born in the same cottage. And though they were 70 or 80 years old, they would know that that swarm that's been in that tree has been there for X number of years. Yes, I know it could possibly die out uh, and then another swarm go in, but some of these uh, really old country folk were pretty sharp about what was going on uh, uh, around them, and I, I, I would tend to believe them. It's my guess um, that naturally losses um, are perhaps around about 5% or probably, probably a shade more, perhaps 5 to 10%. But that's what my, my, my guess is. What is that? <clears throat> well, a few predators, and a lot of colonies are lost during the winter, mice get in or whatever, got dry conditions. Where do you find a natural nest? 8, 10, 12, 15 feet up a tree, not on the ground where, 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 where we keep it. And the vast majority of trees um, are actually dry inside. <clears throat> Healthy. Um, no weaklings, because of course the, uh, the fittest uh, uh, so, um, uh, survived and the weaklings just succumbed a long time ago. In the wild, every colony is a full colony. You don't get little nukes and whatever. They are all full colonies. So they're not as vulnerable as a lot of our managed colonies uh, are. If they select their own home, it's usually uh, with a small entrance. If there is a bigger entrance, um, they've generally got ways of um, uh, closing it off. Therefore, little robbing, and of course, one, um, uh, one reason for um, uh, losses is, uh, of course, robin. And, of course, in the natural state, beekeepers aren't involved. <laughs> Not you, but everybody else. No. <laughs> My guess is that before we started messing around with, with bees, queen mating was a lot nearer 100% than it is currently. Currently, it's way down, 20 30%, something like that. It really is. Um, but there are problems with... Um, uh, getting queens mated, which I've spent an awful lot of time writing about. I suspect in a natural situation, um, it's, it's very, very high. So why do we have um, uh, high losses then? Well, we keep bees uh, near the ground, damp and uh, predators and that sort of thing. We tend to keep uh, bees that are perhaps not best suited to our environment. We keep importing stuff, don't we? Keep importing them and uh, they're not best suited to uh, our way. We mollycoddle bees. <clears throat> um, we, put, um, uh, we put all sorts of things around them, we insulate them, uh, we treat them with um, all sorts of medication. What are we doing? We're effectively putting bees on life support, aren't we? <laughs> if we uh, have a, uh, a poor colony or a diseased colony, um, perhaps we'll treat it if it's diseased, how many people then requeen it? How many? I suggest not very many, but on the other hand, if, um, uh, if a colony or if a queen is susceptible, why keep her? And poor management, which I've already uh, uh, mentioned, perhaps trying to get bees that are too weak going through the, the winter, poor feeding or anything of that nature. And the queen problems that I've briefly mentioned, and I've been mentioning for the best part of 20 years, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll carry on because I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to crack this one. Early supersedure of young queens, young queens failing, and queens simply disappearing. Simply disappearing. So they are um, issues. 
And my local teaching uh, association, uh, we had a, a, a colony three weeks ago, uh, it was absolutely fine. Uh, a couple of days ago, in fact, Tuesday, um, the, um, uh, the Queen has disappeared. She has gone. We got a Queen's colony, and that one gave us, um, uh, I think, two brood chambers of um, honey and, and, and three supers on. It gave us the most honey. It had gone. And outside influences, which um, I'm sure you know uh, a little bit more about uh, than, than I do. So I'm going to speak to you mainly about bees in trees because in this part of the world, that's naturally um, where they will uh, live. A natural nest is much taller than it is wide in a tree. Not in a building, could be anything in a, in, 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 in a building. Buildings don't always replicate trees apart from perhaps chimneys. But then you've got a difference because um, naturally um, uh, an entrance is, is at the bottom if bees can work it that way. But of course a chimney, uh, it's, uh, it's at the top. You tend to get a lot of bees um, under floorboards. Um, well then of course they've got to go horizontal. So their, um, uh, their differences and that's why I'm, I'd rather speak a little bit more about trees than uh, buildings. But what I do know is that bees actually adapt pretty well, uh, despite some of the things that, um, that, 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 that are thrown at them. Here's an example. I'm sorry it's an old photograph. That is very nearly 50 years old. Um, it's a big, um, big pine tree, uh, and that was the top end of it, by the way. <clears throat> and um, uh, you can see roughly what, uh, what, what happens, but there, is a, there was a rotten core that went right down to the middle of the nest. And what the bees had done, they built all the way around it, so none of the combs were more than about uh, three inches, something like that. So let's just look at a colony of tree and see what happens. And I'm talking now about the first year, and I'm going to put some diagrams on here, which is, a, uh, I've got to apologise for my poor attempt at uh, drawing in, um, in PowerPoint. Timing is for southern England because that's where I've done the majority of the, um, uh, the, of the removals. <laughs> now, cavities in trees do vary considerably. And I've um, got one drawn up here, um, but they, they really can be uh, quite easily four or five feet uh, tall. I have seen them uh, uh, taller than that. So what happens with a swarm then? Uh, when a colony uh, decides to swarm. And I've got to say this is my view. If you want to pass any of the uh, exams, uh, don't quote this because you'll probably get, get, get failed. But this is my take on it, but only uh, because this is what the bees have told me. I think when a colony puts, or, or queen puts uh, uh, eggs in queen cells, if indeed she does, and that's something that's open to... Uh, uh, a bit of debate too. Um, <clears throat> I think the scouts go out almost straight away looking for a new home. Usually, not always, but usually. Um, and you can see this because if, if you've got, let's say, a box of, uh, some boxes of comb or something outside your back door, you can see um, bees flying around there um, for several days, perhaps six or eight days before uh, the swarm comes in. Now you could argue with several colonies, um, I don't know, um, but I haven't got um, any paint and markers and things like that all the time to, uh, to dot around like, 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 like some people have. <laughs> right, I suspect they're going out looking for a suitable home and in human terms they seem to pick somewhere that is uh, defendable, um, dry, Perhaps the right size, although I have seen some in buildings in, in thumping great uh, 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 gaps. Uh, height, there's a bit of discussion about that. We always seem to be told they're just about head height, aren't they? Eight, eight or ten feet um, uh, high. Personally, I don't think that matters too much because I've seen them very low down and I've actually seen them uh, really high. <clears throat> now, there is one other uh, element which is energy lines. And I know you're going to say, oh, here he goes about his energy lines again. I actually think uh, it's relevant, um, but I won't be pushing it too much. Um, but I hope at the end of, end of the day, somebody does research on it, because I think 
it's, um, it is actually quite relevant. Then <clears throat> perhaps they decide uh, where to go in the hive. That's my guess. I know there's a view that they do it once they've um, uh, come out and clustered. Personally, I think they've done it before then. Otherwise, um, uh, why are they spending so long um, uh, uh, scouting? I think that they protect, they seem to take ownership beforehand and they seem to protect their site. Um, I may be barking up the wrong tree, but on many occasions I've seen a, a bait hive and um, uh, you, you can see fighting going on at the entrance. I've interpreted it as uh, a, a colony deciding that's where they're going to go and they're going to repel all borders. Whether that is right or not, I don't know. Um, and I hope these are the sort of questions that perhaps uh, Tom is going to answer later. Swarm issues uh, and then clusters as we know. Now, you'll always see bees on the surface of a swarm uh, dancing. And the, um, I think people take that as a, they're, they're, um, uh, they're deciding where to go. It's only a personal view, but my guess is they've decided sometime before and all they're really doing is reinforcing where they've actually got to go. I know there's stories about people uh, cycling down streets and following bees and all sorts of things like that, um, but personally I think it's already done. Now, <clears throat> something else. I think that the scouts that are there waiting for the swarm to come actually guard the new home and defend it. Um, I know it's getting back to human terms, but think what happens if, the, if all the scouts went back uh, and in the meantime somebody else took ownership of it. Um, I don't know, but I, I think that that is the case. Then of course the swarm arrives. Occasionally that doesn't happen. <laughs> I was uh, putting my washing out before nine o'clock one morning uh, and there it is, and this is the date when this photograph and time when this photograph was taken. 8.54am, June the 9th, 2011. Right, uh, I was hanging my washing out and over the top of my house, straight down the garden, went a swarm and I thought, crikey, that's, uh, uh, that's early in the 10 o'clock, we're always told that they, uh, that, that, that they go out. Anyway, I followed it straight down. It went into this hive that was on top of another hive. Now the story is... Um, that hive I brought from outside, at, uh, gone nine o'clock the previous evening, and just happened to place it on top of a hive for somewhere for it to go. So in that case, that colony could not have done very much uh, uh, scouting. So I think it is very, very variable. So what does a swarm take with it? Well, obviously uh, a queen also takes drones. Have a look at a swarm, see what's in it. Why does, a, why does a, a swarm need drones? If they've got a, a fertile queen, they don't need it. If they've got a virgin queen, it's much better, surely, if she's got mated with somebody else's uh, 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 drones. I don't know uh, the answer. I should press and put a question mark there. They take workers of all ages. Uh, now, I know what some of the books tell you. They take about half the flying force. Have a look at a swarm. See the age of the bees, and you'll see little um, uh, greyish sort of downy bees that clearly haven't flown before. Uh, why do they do that? Well, of course, the young ones are the um, uh, uh, producer brood food, don't they? We're told they take honey um, uh, with them. I've put here uh, nectar um, because I don't know, and I don't know if anyone's ever done any uh, studies as to whether they do take honey or nectar. If you think about it, um, if they take honey, um, they're taking more carbohydrate content than if they took nectar. But um, whether that's the case or not, I don't know, um, and I hope we get the answer uh, this, this afternoon. They take pollen. You can see um, uh, bees in a swarm taking pollen uh, with them. Now, in our terms, we seem to think that is insurance against uh, bad weather. Um, so uh, They probably do as well. Right, now the energy lines, and I'll, I'll be, be really brief on this. Um, uh, if you take a tree uh, with a hole in it, every colony that I've come across that has selected its own home, whether it's a, a, a bait hive, 
uh, an empty hive, a tree, a uh, building, anything like that has got at least three energy lines going through it. Now, let's not worry too much about um, uh, it being sort of pseudoscience or anything uh, like that. Just think of it as a, a sort of line of energy that goes goes through the um, uh, through the uh, uh, through the nest. Right. It's my view that they do that, perhaps um, uh, to do with uh, navigation, but I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure of it. All I know is that bumblebees and wasps don't do the same thing. I hope at some stage somebody's going to do some uh, 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 work on it, but I think it's. Um, uh, I, I, I think they'll find something anyway. Uh, but I did ask you to have an open mind, and I'm going to return to this later because it is more relevant elsewhere. Right, take a section through a tree with a, a cavity in it, and they're never that shape, but it's my, uh, my attempt at PowerPoint. The entrance is usually at the bottom, not always, but it's usually at the bottom, and fairly close to the nest too, although I have had some that have been that far away from the uh, nest. I want you folk to assume that that cavity is empty because slightly different things happen if there's already comb uh, in there. So the swarm starts, um, as soon as it goes in there, swarm starts building comb. I won't say almost straight away, but certainly with, a, with, a, with an hour or two, obviously uh, at the top. The bees quickly place nectar and pollen in the cells. And um, uh, if the queen is fertile, um, she's usually laying well within 24 hours. Um, and anybody who's taken a, a swarm one afternoon or evening, imprisoned it overnight, and gone and uh, tried to put it in a hive nine o'clock in the morning, that's usually what you get. <coughs> if you've got a fertile queen, 80% of the time is going to be eggs in the, um, uh, in, in the cell. So really get cracking. That's a, the sort of amount, probably only one, perhaps the start of a second um, uh, comb. They really get cracking, and even that has probably got nectar and uh, pollen uh, in it. Um, Right, so we're still back, back with their tree. They've got no brood to feed uh, for four or five days. Therefore, any food they've got, um, they can produce wax. And, uh, of course, it's in the first few days that they, um, that they do an awful lot of building. Then starts um, a, a really rapid build-up over the next, uh, next week or so. Um, the brood then starts to, uh, uh, to get sealed. The brood nest expands and develops. All the time the bees are producing more wax underneath and at the sides. The, there is a band of pollen usually mainly above the brood but not always. Um, bees do vary quite a bit. So for the first seven to ten days, they're absolutely crucial for a swarm that's gone into a, uh, into a home without any feeding, without any help or anything like that. It really is the difference between starvation and prosperity, which I think may well be why they're much better at weather forecasting than, than we are. Now, as a colony expands, uh, the queen lays under the existing brood and at the side. They're, um, uh, they're expanding the brood all the time. Now, this is different than what we're told that the queen lays and then, and then lays the circles out. That's in a, uh, a managed nest, in a natural nest, in an expanding situation. Um, it's, it's usually underneath and at the side. Bees will usually only build comb, A, when it's needed, and B, when they've got some income with which to, um, uh, uh, to produce uh, the wax with. One of those out and um, uh, they, they don't usually build uh, anymore. So in a nectar flow, um, the emerged cells at the top are filled with pollen and nectar. Um, and you can see this if you've, if you've got a new sort of hive with foundation in, because bees a swarm will behave a bit like this when, when, when they start. Right, now the brood moves down as the nest expands. What you end up with is the, is the brood nest expanding and also growing down like that. So you end up with, um, uh, with a bigger brood nest. And uh, the, 
uh, you get the older brood at the top, the younger brood at the bottom, because that's where the queens lay in uh, all, all the time. So in a nectar flow, oh, by the way, those dots are pollen in the, um, in the cells. In a nectar flow, uh, the brood area is driven uh, down, and the food store increases because they're really replacing brood with, uh, w w with food. So you get unused pollen um, sealed underneath honey for, for future use. Okay, it's, be, it's, it's probably bee bread, but um, uh, you know what I mean. Now, the thing is, in the winter, they've got all this food with pollen in, all the way through. Right, now, if there's no nectar flow, um, of course, the uh, vacated cells at the top, what happens? Usually the queen lays, lays in them, which really means that the brood nest stays roughly where it is. Then in comes more nectar and down they go again. <laughs> so in the late summer, um, the brood nest uh, uh, contracts. Queen usually reduces uh, uh, laying or stops at the e end of the summer. Um, with the more native bees, in my, t uh, my part of uh, uh, the world, which is West Sussex, Usually, first couple of weeks in, uh, in August, uh, they, they would go off. But the weather's often good in the autumn, getting to September. And what, what do we get? In my area, uh, we get a late flow, um, both nectar and pollen. Uh, and you get quite a lot of pollen in the, in the uh, well, both, both spring and uh, autumn. We get rose bay willow herb, flea bane, ivy, those sort of uh, plants, all of which. Um, uh, produce um, uh, produce quite, quite quite good quantities. Now, ivy has really only started uh, yielding heavily in my area in about the last ten years, something like that, and it started to cause us cause us problems. I see some Irish people here, and they've they've always seemed to have had it. Um, what they do to get over the problems that we have, uh, I don't know, because of course ivy granulates um, very uh, uh, very quickly and very solidly. Now, there may be considerable income, quite a bit at the back end of the year. Don't forget, there's not that much brood, uh, so they're not using too much, so they can, uh, they, they can store it. So a queen tends to come back into lay, uh, and typically, in my area, they go off lay for perhaps four weeks, uh, four or five weeks, something uh, like that. Of course, it's aggravated now because of the, um, uh, of, of the treatment, so it's not easy to work out what bees are doing naturally. At that point, we then get winter bees reared, uh, which of course are fed by the uh, recent income. So there's no real burden on the uh, colony. So what can we learn from that? Well, ivy honey granulates, as uh, most of us know, and can cause problems uh, during the winter. But in a natural nest with no restriction, <laughs> uh, no floorboard, no queen excluder, no crown board, um, uh, that sort of thing, it's a, it's a lot easier for them. Don't forget, last in, first out, the bees can use that ivy honey um, uh, when they're active. The problem, of course, is with granulated honey, if they're inactive, they can't get out to get water to, um, uh, to liquefy it. But October, November is usually uh, no problem. Um, and of course they've got liquid honey available for the uh, rest of the winter. Don't forget they've still got a bit of um, stuff from um, honey from flea bane, um, uh, rose bay willow herb, plus of course all the stuff they've um, uh, got in uh, during the summer. But what happens? We take the supers off, don't we? So we've taken all their liquid honey off. So what can end up happening is we put the crown board on, uh, the uh, in comes the ivy honey. Um, the queens can then be crowded out, so there are less winter bees produced. And even in the last three or four years, uh, I've seen colonies with little brood areas um, about the size of a tennis ball that the uh, uh, that's all the queens got to lay in. They seem to survive okay. Um, of course, then they can have a brood box full of absolutely solid floor, um, uh, food with uh, less, less liquid. Now, the hive feels heavy to you. You go along and heft it. Cool, that feels like, well, that's all right. That lasts till April. And, of course, uh, they, they starve out um, because um, uh, they can't, uh, can't use the food. And this is what happens. Can you hope you can see all that? 
Um, so I think Tom mentioned about um, uh, water uh, collection. They, of course, need it to liquefy this. But don't forget, in a, if, the, if the bees are clustered, it makes it much more difficult for them. So we're back to autumn, winter, with little or no uh, income. Queen tends to lay at the top of the brood area and in the uh, vacated cells. And of course, they've got all the food that's above them and perhaps to uh, the back, which they uh, survive on during the winter. So that's really how a colony of bees uh, uh, survives the whole year. And of course, they've got pollen available um, throughout their food because they put it there. Um, the surplus requirements at the time, they've uh, preserved it. Don't forget, they're going to have to live on it for at least six months, probably eight, uh, until the um, uh, uh, spring uh, when, of course, new, new food is coming in. If you get a bad summer, if you work it out, colony could well need um, that amount of food to get through about 20 months' worth. Think about it. So this is what they do. Um, this is some um, uh, comb that came out of a, a, a building, tipped on its side. So the pollen is distributed through the, uh, through the stores, so they've got it. Right. They put a little bit of honey over the top, and if you notice um, cells with uh, pollen in, they never fill them. They always leave a gap. And um, of course, what they do is if they don't need it, they um, they put honey over it, seal it, and then it will um, stay for some time. Now, I'm asking the question, do we leave enough pollen for winter? Don't forget, you folk, you take off your supers. How many frames of pollen do you, do, uh, do, do you take out? And you know what happens. It, 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 um, uh, you, you, you run it around in the extractor. The extractor goes out of balance. You start swearing. Uh, you put it back in your shed. Um, and what you're doing is putting a load of uh, a resource in that the bees have spent um, an awful long time collecting. So we perhaps we've got to find some way of uh, managing that. Um, and I'll come up with an idea later. So I'm asking, should we feel, feed slowly in the autumn rather than feeding down heavily? If you feed down heavily, get it all done in a week, the bees haven't got chance to go out and get pollen to put under the nectar in, in, in the combs. Um, but if you feed little and often, they can go out and do that. So I'm suggesting that we feed um, more gently in, in the autumn. So back to our colony, then we've got uh, spring again, rapid build up again, down goes the um, uh, uh, brood nest and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the cyclists con continue. So in a natural colony, uh, we get brood underneath uh, the stores and the brood nest is going up and down all the time depending on uh, conditions. So let's just transfer that over to uh, a managed hive. So there's a natural colony. Um, the top is fixed, always. Brood moves up and down vertically, but in a managed colony, in a managed hive, uh, we put a fixed bit at the bottom, the floor. And then we put another barrier, either the crown board or a, a queen excluder, so that the queen is confined there. Right? Now the brood nest can't go up and down, so what do we do? We put the empty comb uh, on top. Where do the bees expect it? Always underneath. Right? So we're actually turning the hive upside down almost. Then, of course, we put a, a crown board or uh, inner cover uh, on the top, and it's that that goes up and down. So everything's upside down. Well, I'm asking you folks, is the worry hive such a daft idea after all? Because of course that's what they're doing. Or perhaps the rose method, which is a sort of modified um, uh, way of doing it with a, with, with a standard hive. Now here's a natural nest, uh, albeit in a, in a barn. <coughs> Look at the shape of the comb and where things uh, are. In a natural nest, usually the combs are taller than they are wide, certainly in, a, in trees anyway, with food above the brood. You can see what's happened there. But here's a British standard uh, frame, single brood chamber uh, in the autumn. I think this was taken early November one year. That's where the entrance is. Of course, the bees put the, put the brood uh, near the entrance. 
Food should be above the brood, but there isn't that much room. So what have they done? They've gone sideways. Here's not the same frame, but a similar sort of thing uh, in the spring. Uh, there's the brood. Should go down, with queen laying uh, underneath, but can't do that. So they've been forced sideways. I don't know. I'm just asking if this uh, stresses bees. I don't know. Perhaps somebody's done some work on it. Um, and uh, perhaps nobody's bothered about it. Look at something else as well. We're always told that they put pollen above the brood, aren't we? There it is underneath. But native bees, AMM, do tend to put pollen underneath the brood um, uh, quite regularly. <laughs> I'm not saying that's a native bee, but uh, that's, uh, you know, it just goes to show that sometimes the books aren't always right. Here's another photograph that's the best part of uh, 50 years old. Um, another uh, big log, it's probably about that high, I would think. So you can see the cavity. And you can see how black the, uh, black the combs are. That's been in there some time. <laughs> Here is a building with a different shape. Now, that is... Um, where the bees have clearly been for some time, that's where the brood area is. They can't go up, they can't go down. So they've gone sideways. Have they gone sideways to uh, expand? Or have they perhaps gone sideways to move the brood nest, to abandon some comb for the wax moss to clean out so at uh, some later date they can move back? I don't know, just asking the uh, question. What happens to waste in a colony? Plenty of it. Where does it come from? Cappings, brood cappings, that sort of thing. What happens to it? It drops down to the bottom. How are the bees going to get it out? Well, clicks in there. The answer is wax moth, of course, um, because they go in, feed on it, and just recycle it and just get... Uh, uh, just get rid of it. There's a building with an old um, colony in, which has died out. It, in have gone the wax moss, and you can see the mess that it's made of it. Uh, unless there's some mechanism for getting that out, that's actually quite difficult for um, uh, bees to, to go in there and establish a, a nest again. Uh, not only are, the, uh, are there cocoons, there are also uh, cobwebs, which, of course, as you know, from the inside of a hive roof, um, uh, cobwebs and bees don't go too well together. I don't think I've ever seen a wild colony uh, with a wax moth problem in the nest area. And I think the reason for this is they've got enough downstairs that they haven't got to bother the rest of the uh, nest in the same way that they're doing a managed hive where we keep everything uh, nice and clean. I'm not suggesting that we should chuck some old... Um, uh, uh, wax or comb in the bottom of the hive. I'm not suggesting that, I'm just uh, um, pointing it out. So are wax moth actually that bad? I think they do a pretty good job really one way or another. Um, what I do know is if you keep your colony strong uh, as they are in the wild, they are no uh, problem. A um, few random observations. Um, uh, there's only enough comb built by a colony for its uh, immediate needs. If you get a swarm going to a cavity, there was very little drone comb built in the first season. Very little. If you think about it, they don't need it. Um, also, have a look at natural comb. We tend to think the points of the cells should always be at the top. Actually, it's surprising uh, how often they're not. They can, they can be even at 90 degrees, you know, so you've got a flat, flat at the top and any, any, any point in between. You know if you get um, emergency cells in the colony and you don't start pulling them out, you, um, for the next two or three years perhaps, uh, you see evidence of where the emergency cell was. I have never, ever seen that in a wild colony. So I tend to think that emergency cells... Um, are used by the bees because the beekeeper's probably done uh, something wrong. Um, and I can never recall seeing a drone laying queen in a natural colony, never. So perhaps that might be induced by the beekeeper as well, but I don't know, I've only probably removed 300 colonies from wild places. 
Uh, now, drone comb, um, this is only a, a, an estimate. I've never done any um, uh, uh, measurements, but I reckon area-wise, it's about 10 to 15% of the total uh, area on the periphery of the nest, either uh, the side or uh, under, underneath. If you think about it, the colony only needs it when it's, when it's large and built up. So that's, um, and it doesn't need it in the winter when, of course, the nest is um, uh, uh, contracting. So perhaps that's the uh, reason. Uh, I'm asking you, is removing drone comb a good idea? Um, and I know we're told, oh, that's, um, uh, there's a lot of drone comb, uh, uh, drone in that uh, comb, get rid of it. Bees are telling me that we, they need 10 to 15% which in a 10 comb, 11 comb box is roughly one comb uh, per box. So that's really the amount we're looking at. How many of you folk do comb changes? How many of you use all worker foundation? How many use drone foundation in some of your combs? Mm, few, not many. Um, but that's what we tend to do, isn't it? The bees have got to get their drone comb somehow. How are they going to do it? They're going to chew down what's already there. They've decided that's what they want. Plastic foundation. Now, I may be barking up the wrong tree, um, but earlier this year, and in fact last year, I went out to uh, the States. I was invited out there to do um, a queen, um, a queen, queen marine course. <laughs> and uh, the, f uh, uh, the first apiary I went to, I opened the first colony and uh, they, they, they just seemed, a uh, full colony, they seemed absolutely lifeless, you know, there's no sort of vibrancy to them and it was a beautiful day, uh, it was in June so it would, um, uh, and, it, and it was quite hot, I'd expected the bees to be pouring in, in, in and out and uh, these bees were absolutely lifeless and I thought, cocky, bit, bit of a problem here. Went to the next one and then all of a sudden I thought to myself, where's all the drones? And I spoke to the beekeeper and said, look, no, it doesn't seem to be too many drones in here compared to our hives. Oh, it's, uh, that's normally said. And then it struck me, uh, and I haven't spoken to Tom about this, it struck me that we're just using 100% plastic foundation with no drone in there. And uh, the, the, the bees didn't seem to be breaking down the, uh, the cells, the worker cells, to build uh, a drone. And I think it was just the morale of the colony um, uh, that was going. So um, that's, that's a conclusion I came to, which may well be wrong. So what I tend to do in my brood chambers is put one drone comb per box, close to the edge, not the outside <laughs> uh, frame, but the next one in, because that's where the bees are telling me they want it, on, 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 the, on, on the periphery. So let's just look at drone cells. If you um, look at drone comb, um, you'll find that bees very, very rarely put pollen in, in, in drone cells. If you think about it, they don't really need it during the winter, so perhaps that's, that's why. Uh, I'm just asking the question, are they not better for supers? Because what's the point of bees producing uh, or, or, or bringing in all that pollen, squeezing through the queen excluder, putting it in those cells for you folk to chuck in the back of your shed to go mouldy. Um, so perhaps we ought to be looking at uh, drone, uh, 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 drone comb in supers rather than worker, which is what I do. Comb spacing. There seems to be two main uh, sizes. 38 millimetres, which is um, the old inch and a half, or 36 millimetres. Um, I've religiously measured centre to centre combs in a situation like that, where they're, where they're fairly, um, uh, fairly well organised, and it seems to be between 36 and 38 millimetres. Right, that lines up with what I call British um, uh, spacing and you measure uh, met plastic or metal ends or castellations um, they are 38. Hoffman's are 35. <clears throat> Both our Hoffman's and also Langstroth Hoffman's although interestingly Dayton Hoffman's are 38. 
If you think about it, uh, out of that 35 to 38 millimetres, you've got the width of a cone, so the variation is going to be between the gap between the faces of the two cones. And if you think about it, you're dropping down about 30% space. Now, <clears throat> I'm asking if that stresses the, the bees, because in nature they're telling me that they want 36 to 38 millimetres. Does it increase swarming? All these bees packed together closer than they, uh, than they should be. Does it increase chronic bee paralysis for us? We had a question and answer session on Thursday and somebody asked a question about chronic bee paralysis for us and the answer came back, or one of the answers came back, was that, that, that bees that are packed together, um, uh, they, uh, the, the, they break the hairs off each other and it transmits the, uh, uh, the virus. So I'm just asking the question, does it make the situation with the virus worse? I don't know, no evidence. Um, that's for somebody else to sort out. Um, this is um, a tower, a wood factory. Well, not anymore, because it was taken down. Um, but um, what it was was a, was a sawdust hopper. <coughs> and uh, there's a colony uh, inside there. You can see that they've already made an attempt to propolize up the hole. Just look and see what's inside, if indeed you can. And uh, faster you wouldn't get food anywhere near an entrance like that. The bees would, 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 would put it away somewhere, presumably for, for defence uh, reasons. You can see brood on the right there, um, but you, yes, they'll put that there, but they wouldn't put food. And you can also see the points of the cells are not at the top. So that's another instance of um, the uh, bees not always putting cells at the top. This is another building, <coughs> wooden building. Uh, the bees have propolised the entrance up, look. Um, I think that was a woodpecker tried to, try to get uh, in there. This was their only ventilation. Only ventilation. <laughs> See what the bees have done? They put two little holes in there, about the size you get the finger in. So the overall size of that was 70 millimetres by 45, so less than three by less than two. Right, and the bees have decided that that was too difficult uh, uh, to defend. So I'm asking if our entrances are too big. Always think about, got to have big wide entrances so the bees can fly in and out. They're doing okay. Propolis curtains. Most of you have probably heard more about them than seen them. In fact, they're, they're not particularly common. Uh, probably uh, one in 10 or even less. This one here was taken out of a, uh, uh, an elm tree, so that'll tell you how long ago that was, uh, that was taken. That one was about 10 inches, 250 millimetres uh, long. And you can see just under here, part of the rotten wood. Um, so it was in the entrance um, by the rotten wood, and there was a, a, a slot in the tree about eight or 10 inches uh, high, only about half an inch wide. These curtains um, can be around about six to eight millimetres. That's about the thickest thing you get. That is absolutely solid propolis. Solid propolis. Oh, propolis. This is a board out of a, a, a wooden building. And I uh, hope you can see there that the bees have actually smeared propolis uh, all over the wood. Um, why have they done that? because it was presumably a sawn board, it wouldn't have been a plain board, but a sawn board, there was no need to. But we tend to think that the bees propolise the inside of their nest, and they do propolise all the inside of their nest in time. They don't do it instantly. Um, we tend to think it's a stabilised rotten wood, which of course it may well do. Um, but we now know that uh, because propolis is antibacterial, antifungal and anti-everything else you can think of, that they're probably um, smearing the inside of their home uh, for health reasons. We do get some bees that propolise a lot heavier than others. Should we actually requeen them or, or are they perhaps healthier bees? It might be a little study that somebody could do or it, they might even have done it, I don't know. How many of you folk uh, scorch your boxes out to keep things nice and clean and that sort of thing? How many of you? Okay. Right. I'm wondering if we're actually not doing the bees a bit of harm because don't forget they're, they're smearing the inside of their, 
uh, th their nest for their own health reasons. I'm just asking the question, do we actually clean our kit too much? I have never ever scorched out a brood box. Are we not doing the bees any harm? I'll ask the question again. Now how many of you are scorching your boxes out? <laughs> Less than it was 10 seconds ago. <laughs> This is a cavity. Uh, this building had to get taken down because it was going to an open air, air, air museum. This cavity has clearly been reoccupied. Um, you can see evidence of previous occupation there, and you can see uh, wax moth cocoons here. But look at it. It's nowhere near the shape of a natural nest. Nowhere near the shape. It's wider than it is uh, high. Now, combs can be built in any direction. Forget all this north and south stuff, east and west, or whatever that some people put up. In a natural nest, they will go any way. Um, okay, something fairly open like that, um, uh, that where they've got a clear uh, space. Um, yes, they will probably build them all in line. But even, even these, that one there, they built at a different angle. Why do they build, build them at different angles? Oh, firstly, they don't always follow previous combs. So where you've seen a line of comb that's perhaps been taken down, it could be somebody that's removed a colony five, ten years ago or whatever. They don't always follow the previous comb. So perhaps there's nothing uh, in the sort of north and south uh, business. What I do know is that in the vast majority of um, uh, cases, they are in line with what I call energy lines. They, they may not be energy lines, but if anybody wants to talk to me about it afterwards, um, uh, I'm happy to. I've had it said to me on so many occasions, oh yeah, but you're influencing this way and the other. When that one, when that particular one was covered up, I could predict which way the cones were likely to go. And I can still do that now, even though it's, um, it's open. So I think there's something in it. With a natural nest, um, you get the, uh, the bees at the bottom, food at the top. During the winter, and uh, in a natural nest, you can probably have as few as four or five combs, you know, sort of six or so, um, and, and that's probably six to eight, perhaps, is, is, is an average. All they do during the winter is munch, 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 all the way up. No problem uh, at all. Um, but, of course, in a situation like this, they munch, munch, munch up, all of a sudden hit the, um, uh, the wood, what do they do? Because if they're in tight cluster, they're not likely to move. Right, so what do bees do? I think they forage within the nest in the winter when it's a cooler uh, period, uh, sorry, warmer period, they break cluster, go out and bring food in to where they are. And I've seen evidence of that, or what I think is evidence on uh, many occasions um, you, know, you could go in a colony uh, in, let's say, December, and there's quite a lot of unsealed food around where the bees are, um, are clustering. <laughs> colony density. Um, natural colony density, that is. Uh, here's a barn in West Sussex, about five miles from uh, me. In the end of that barn, there are three nests, and you can see two of them have been in there a fair length of time. There was actually another one there. So... In a, in a barn, you know, from here to that wall, on the end wall, at least four nests at, uh, at uh, any one time. Now, um, in 2009, that particular barn, I was involved in uh, removing 11 uh, colonies or swarms from that barn. So there was something going on. You know, why, why pick on that? There was plenty of trees, um, there were buildings uh, 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 around. Now, we would think, um, as humans, that um, the higher the density, the more pressure there is put on the, the forage uh, outside, wouldn't we? So why not move half a mile away or, you know, take up home half a mile away? Actually, there's a whole load of energy lines going through the end of that barn, but I won't, I won't, I won't hold you up on that one. Holes in nests. This is one area where Tom and myself did have a little bit of a, a, a discussion, and he's made me... Uh, think a bit more about what I've um, what I've seen. Um, in a in a tree with a fairly narrow um, uh, cavity, um, uh, I now agree with uh, Tom. You very 
or you get less holes in the comb. In a wide area like that, and we're probably talking about 18 inches wide, 15, 18 inches wide, something like that, you generally get uh, holes and, of course, uh, B spaces down the side. So what are they using it for? We suspect travel and communication, uh, for one thing, uh, cut time down and that sort of thing, or perhaps distributing uh, pheromones. Now, if you have got a great big slab of comb <coughs> and the queen's laying on one side, um, I don't know how bee queens move around in a hive, but let's say she moves, um, uh, she stays on one side of half an hour, three quarters an hour, something like that. Um, how do her pheromones get round to the rest of the bees? If you've just got a, a, a big slab of um, a comb, they've got to get over the top, underneath, round the, uh, round the side to get to the, other, to the other bees. Have they got holes so that they can communicate better between, um, between themselves and, and other bees? Does it contribute to swarming if you've got this great big um, uh, slab of brood? Asking the question, are our frames too large? 14 by 12s, Dadents, Langstroths and that sort of thing. Um, is it actually causing the bees a, a, a problem? On the other hand, should we actually cull uh, cones with holes in? I suggest we don't. Um, what I do know is I've never seen isolation starvation in a wild colony. So perhaps during the winter, the bees can move through between one comb and another, whereas in a, in a managed colony, they can't get round the ends of the combs so why not make holes in your comb? Perhaps an apple core or something like that. Just one hole in the middle of each one and see if it works. The bees I've dealt with, um, they're usually very good tempered. I cannot remember a bad tempered wild colony. Don't know why that is, but I, I can't. Now, if they're established for some time, they uh, have got the characteristics of our native bees. They are usually non-prolific, or always non-prolific. When I say established for some time, at least 12 months. They're usually dark. You do not get these bright yellow jobbies uh, with their bright yellow queens. You do not get them living in natural situations. Just don't, 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 don't even see it. They don't live very long. Um, I think probably they need a lot more food than uh, other colonies, and perhaps they're not quite uh, tough. But if you think about it, it's natural selection which is uh, exactly the things that two gentlemen 170 years ago the names of Wallace and Darwin were t telling us, and we're still not listening, are we? Because we've got beekeepers who still keep buying uh, in in imports. It was native bees that um, uh, uh, evolved here. OK, there aren't so many as there were, but at least let the bees, uh, or have bees, that have got their same characteristics. Uh, combs. I have seen some very old, very black, and very heavy ones. They have been there a long time. And you know what we're told about these combs? They're disease, this, that, and the other. Bees always seem very healthy, because if they're not, nature takes, um, uh, uh, takes them out. I do wonder if perhaps the heavier the comb, the better the insulation. Don't know, might, might, might be a red herring. I have never seen foul brood in a wild colony. Never, never, never. And any chalk brood is usually very light. If there is any, you, you don't get masses of chalk brood like you do in a, in a managed colony. So I'm asking the question, are wild colonies always a reservoir of a disease that we're told they are? I suspect they're probably not. On the other hand, are disease levels in managed colonies falsely high? I suspect they are. People doing things, moving combs around, all sorts of things like that without recognising the diseases. Do the comb changes and the medicines and the cleansers and the supplements, all sorts of things that we're supposed to do, does it actually suppress the natural disease resistance of the bees? I don't know, I'm just asking the question. Are we hindering natural selection. So, just a few thoughts. Do bees survive because they're adaptable, despite what we chuck at them? Do we really understand our bees? Really understand?
Do we, at the end of the day, treat them kindly? All the things we're supposed to do to them, do we, are we actually treating them kindly? Do we encourage stock that nature wouldn't tolerate? Is best practice always best? And should we change our thinking? I don't know, but I'm asking you if you've changed yours. I've just got more information on Cushman's website. Now your turn, Tom.